So one of the uh, greatest parts of the move was uh, getting the opportunity to work with Dr. Harder. She has been an incredible asset over at the children's programs. One of the really uh, amazing parts of the move uh, from uh, Baltimore to Dallas was um, after probably six or seven rounds of drinks, heavy medication, and a frying pan, I convinced Maureen Mealy to make the leap uh, with us and move from uh, Baltimore to Dallas. And she was uh, and is an incredible asset to our program. And yeah, I uh, can get it from you guys. And then for uh, a variety of reasons, had to make the move back to Baltimore, but we keep in, in close touch, and she's still involved in a variety of our, our patients. And um, uh, before she left, she was the one uh, who knew how hard it was to work with me, because I'm, I'm not an easy person to work with, uh, and wrangled things in, and it's, it's uh, constantly saying, Greenberg, focus, focus, look here. This is what you have to do right now. Don't, don't pay attention to that. Do this. Uh, and so for anyone who ever got a prescription refill or something done, it's only because uh, Maureen was making sure that I was paying attention. And when we were putting the symposium together, I uh, emailed and then called her up and said, I want you to give a talk on uh, entitled, How to Manage Your Care Team. And she said, what? And I said, I want to talk on how to manage your care team. She says, well, exactly what, what are you talking about? And I said, everything you do, every time you're on the phone with patients, counseling them on how to interact with their physicians, how to interact with their physiatrists, their neurologists, their urologists, their internists, psychiatrists, and how to get these group of schizophrenic physicians to work together in some sort of way, which is what you do day in and day out. I want you to teach everyone how to do that. And uh, she thought about it for a while and then energetically agreed. And this is the biggest challenge for individuals uh, with rare complex disorders um, because physicians are not easy to work with. We have our own personalities, we come to the exchange with our own baggage, and physicians uh, need you to make it easy. The analogy I use is a uh, playing ball. You don't want to give your physician curveballs. You want to make it easy for them to hit it out of the park and have success, but it's not an easy thing to do. And Maureen's figured out all the tricks on, on how to do it. So for the next 30 minutes, she's going to enlighten us on how you guys should be managing your care team. So Maureen. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Greenberg. Um, hi, everybody. I, uh, it was actually kind of a daunting task to try and do this because I didn't know how to wrap this up into a tiny little bow and present it. It's just kind of something I do and wasn't very easy for me to figure out how to present. And so I don't know if I accomplished the task or not. And so I apologize in advance if I didn't. But uh, I decided to um, draw a parallel between the healthcare team and and a football team, since as some of you learned yesterday in a moment of great humiliation, uh, Dr. Carlos Pardo may have mentioned that I'm a very big football fan in his transverse myelitis talk. And so it segued well into my presentation, ironically. Uh, so here goes. Your role as the patient or family members of the patient is the quarterback. And as that role, it is your, you are the one who has to keep the team connected. You're the one who has to make sure that the physiatrist knows about the plan for the, from the neurologist, who knows about the plan from the urologist, who knows about the plan from the psychiatrist, et cetera. You're the one calling the plays. Uh, that said, there needs to be a coach, one person who is the person, point person. It can be your primary care, it can be your neurologist, it can be your, uh, your PM&R doc, it can be whomever. But there can only be, not to confuse analogies, but there can't be too many cooks in the kitchen. And so you have to have one doctor that you trust being the coach. But from there, it's your responsibility to kind of connect all these people. And that coach needs to be able to work well with others and kind of uh, manage things for you as you're uh, directing the rest of the team. So what do you look for in a healthcare provider? Someone who's engaged and interested. So a lot of people in this room, I'm, I'm betting that most everybody in this room took a long time to get to the diagnosis that hopefully they all now have. It wasn't an easy process for any of you. 
And hopefully you all found, maybe you went through several different people before you found, but hopefully you all found somebody who ended up being invested in your case, and hopefully you all came to the conclusion that that ended up being much, much, much more to your benefit than finding a Harvard grad. And so I, I hope that you all do realize the importance of, of finding somebody who's passionate and willing to take on your case. But that said, we cannot minimize the importance of finding somebody who sees a lot of your diagnosis. You are dealing with a rare neuroimmunologic disorder. And so somebody who sees your diagnosis is somebody who's going to know the difference between a treatment failure and a mismanaged medication. Or somebody who's going to know that if a symptomatic medication didn't work for you, that there are still 10 other medications that may. And is also going to know what new research may or may not be out there that could benefit you. And so it's important to really look in your area. And, and I know not everybody has that accessible to them. Not everybody lives in Baltimore or Dallas or wherever. And so, uh, but at least to be able to touch bases with somebody occasionally to make sure that you're on the right track is important to do. Somebody who makes himself or herself available. Email is great. Having a nurse is great, particularly um, I mean, I'm obviously biased, but having a nurse who uh, knows the disease process the way the doctor knows the disease process is incredibly important. Uh, that means that that doubles your odds of hearing back t twice as quickly. Um, and then somebody who appreciates feedback and advice from other practitioners, and I'm looking at you. Uh, anybody who tells you that they don't want you to get a second opinion is doing you a disservice. Because if one of my patients said that they wanted to hear input from another practitioner, I would welcome that, because that means that somebody else is contributing to a plan, and that's only benefiting you, potentially. And so if somebody else can think of something that's going to help you, then that's great. And if your practitioner doesn't want to have advice from somebody else, then I have to question what, what's wrong with them that they don't want to hear somebody else's take on a situation, particularly a rare neuroimmunologic disorder, where a, a lot of other people may have other ways of looking at this diagnosis. So uh, I had to throw that one in there, Diana. So how to prepare for your appointment. It is well known that an educated patient gets better, uh, gets better health care. They just do. If you come into an appointment with this much knowledge, then your practitioner will get you up to here by the end of the visit. But if you come into a visit with this much knowledge, then your practitioner will get you up to here. Obviously, it's way better to have this much knowledge at the end of a visit than this much knowledge. So the more educated you come into the room, the better. Obviously, the internet is a very great tool and a very dangerous tool all at the same time because information can be uh, accurate and inaccurate, and you don't always know the sources of information. And we'll go over some of the websites. And of course, you've seen most of these websites, all these websites, at some point during the last couple of days. And so I encourage you to go to these sites and uh, other credible sites as opposed to just any site, because there is always inaccurate websites everywhere. Um, be aware of appointment timing. And what I mean by this is doctors have, between generally speaking in most practices, 15 to 30 minutes for a return visit and 30 to an hour for a, a new patient visit. That is not a lot of time. You all know how complicated your diagnosis is. And so you know that, that your uh, the sequelae that comes from your diagnosis cannot be covered in that amount of time. And so given that, you can imagine how backed up the day gets. And so when you're frustrated in the waiting room thinking, this person's not respecting my time, just try to acknowledge that it's not them that made the decision for how long the visits needed to be, first of all. And if you look at it from the perspective of they're not trying to stay on schedule, they're trying to do right by the patient by treating the person in the room rather than paying attention to their schedule, then 
and that means that when you come into the room next, that they're going to be treating you the same way and making sure that they're taking care of you rather than worrying about their schedule, then that might give you a little bit of insight as to why it takes a little bit longer. That said, if you schedule the first appointment of the day, then that's always going to alleviate any kind of worries about having to wait for time. Same way, if your doctor does take a lunch break in the middle of the day, which most of the doctors I've ever worked with don't, so I, I can't relate to that, but if your doctor does, then, uh, then a lot of times that can be a catch-up time and after lunch is a good appointment slot as well. Same way, last appointment of the day is oftentimes a good appointment to make because they're not worrying about, oh my gosh, I still have four more patients out in the waiting room that are cursing at the medical office assistants waiting to be seen because there's nobody else waiting to be seen. You're the last appointment of the day. So those are just some considerations in terms of how to schedule yourself and, and things you can request when you're making appointments. Make sure that the doctor has received all of your records. Uh, they almost always have not. And the one thing that you really need to pay the most attention to is MRIs. You can't fax over MRIs. Most of the doctors that are here at this conference don't just want your uh, report of your MRI. They want to actually be able to look at the films themselves. And so it's very important that really that you check that they actually have the MRI. And chances are you're going to have to go to the facility yourself and have them burn a copy and bring it with you. That's nine times out of 10 the easiest way to get things done in terms of MRI. Write out a list of your meds, including the dose and including over-the-counters and uh, herbals and vitamins, all that sort of thing. You are giving me far too much credit when you tell me that you take the oblong pink pill. I don't know what they all look like. I don't even come close to knowing what they all look like. And so uh, in terms of being able to titrate your medication, if you're telling me you have pain and you take amitriptyline, but you don't know if it's 10 or 100, that makes a world of difference in terms of my ability to try and figure out what, how to titrate that. So please, please, in fact, if you write them out and make it a list that I, that I can keep with me such that, or the doctor can keep with him such that when he's typing out or she's typing out the note, that's perfect. Think about what you want to talk about, and we're, gonna, uh, we're going to get into that a little bit more. So if you think of, along our analogy, if you think of the, uh, the neurologist as the wide receiver, then it's his or her job to catch what's thrown by you. So he, he or she has to catch the pass, but you have to make it a catchable throw. That's your job. And there are many things you can do to make that happen. First one is write down everything. Keep a diary, keep a journal, write down questions, write down symptoms, write down whatever you want. Not so that you can hand him 10 pages or her 10 pages and have them read over it because, again, we're talking about 15, 30 minutes and that's just not the best utilization of your time. It's really to allow you to organize your thinking so that you can read over your journal or your questions or what have you in advance. And then that can allow you to see what is it that's really impacting my life. And then from there, you can prioritize what it is that you want to discuss with your practitioner. And that brings us to number two, prioritize. So as the quarterback, you can choose to either throw the wide receiver a ball, whatever it is that is your priority, whatever it is that's most impacting your life, or you can choose to throw the wide receiver 10 balls. So you can choose to say, I'm having issues with sleep and pain and spasticity and mood and bladder and five other things and let them determine which one they want to address. And it may not be the one that is really the one that's impacting your life, but clearly they can't address all 10 problems. So they're going to choose which ball they want to catch. It may not be the one that you really need to, to focus on. And so having more frequent uh, visits may be what you need until we get until we get everything sorted out. 
The other thing is, is that if you have this many things going on, we can't start you on medications to treat each of these different problems anyway, because that's just irresponsible. So let's figure out what's bothering you right now. Maybe it's your fatigue. Let's say it's fatigue. The fatigue, that's what's really interfering with my ability to interact with my family, to do my job, to cook dinner, to do whatever it is that I want to be doing. That's the one that's really killing me right now. Okay, so now it, the neurologist's job to catch the ball and run with it, right? So they figure out they should be asking you questions. Are you sleeping at night? No, I'm waking up every hour to two hours to go to the bathroom. Okay, so then let's treat that. So we get your nocturia un under control. It ends up now you're sleeping. Uh, it ends up that because we've taken care of your, your inability to sleep and your bladder, that now your daytime fatigue is better and therefore your pain is better and your mood is better and your every other spasticity is better and every other symptom is better. And so the whole point is trying to connect all these symptoms together by treating whatever it is that's, up, that's bothering you right now. And so that's, that's the wide receiver's job. Um, the next thing is be honest. Uh, the doctor is an authoritarian, and so it, uh, many people look at him or her in that manner. But, and so as a result, you want to look good to the doctor. And so you don't want to tell him or her that you're not being compliant with your medication. That's a bad decision. It will only interfere with your ability to, to be treated well. Because if you're not taking your medication, and it's either because you're forgetting to take it or because there's some side effect that's preventing you from, from taking it to being compliant with it, and it's something that we can figure out, and you end up having some kind of relapse because you're not being compliant with your medication, and we think it's because you're being compliant with your medication, and we could have prevented it by figuring out how to make you compliant with your medication, or we could have changed therapies earlier on. Those sort of things could have been addressed earlier on, and, and you did yourself a disservice by not being honest with us that there was something going on with, with, you, being, with you taking the medication to begin with. If possible, bring somebody with you to the appointment for several reasons. Reason number one is that A, it provides another historian. So if you're not always maybe able to provide all the details or somebody else in the room that's chiming in, and sometimes that can be helpful. Number two, it gives a second set of ears listening to the doctor's plan. And number three, it gives uh, somebody else who's now invested in the plan that the doctor is and you have come up with. And so that can be helpful down the road when you're really trying to, to, uh, to especially with rehab plans and things that really need to be uh, focused on at, on a home, at home, that kind of thing. So speaking of rehab, the physiatry, the rehab team, I think of along the same analogy as kind of the running back. They're the ones that are really pushing through, trying to gain every single yard. And they're, our next speaker actually is a neurologist and physiatrist, and he is going to be spending time on this. And so I'm going to uh, do, I, I, he'll be doing much better with this. But my, I do want to emphasize, as Dr. Pardo did yesterday in his transverse myelitis talk, that you will only, uh, that you're, you've, if you have had an injury to your spinal cord or to your brain, doing rehab is bar none the best thing you can do to recover function. And so you will only get out of rehab what you put into it. And so it's infinitely important that you do. And if you choose not to, then you will not recover as much as you ha would have had the potential to do. So I think of uh, the insurance company is looking down on all of us and laughing. But uh, they are kind of the ones that are managing things from up above, and, and the take-home message here is really point number three. Not everybody knows that they can do this, but you can be assigned a case manager from your insurance company. So you all, whether you have a, a recurring disease like multiple sclerosis or NMO, or whether you had a one hit to your central nervous system, such as ADEM or, or idiopathic transverse myelitis, either way, you have, will have sequelae from this di diagnosis for a long time to come. And so 
a case manager allows for you to have a point person within your insurance company and will allow for your doctor's office to have a point person within your insurance company who is kind of facilitating things for you, advocating for you, making sure things don't fall through the crack because Lord knows the doctor's office loses your facts for prior authorizations every day and I know it but um, they kind of make sure that things run a little bit more smoothly than they otherwise would, and not everybody knows that that's a resource that you can elect to have. Most, in most situations, you can. And then don't forget about your nurses. They, are, they can be your best friend, their best ally. They are usually your first pass in terms of the people that are doing most of the triage um, in terms of with the office and they uh, will advocate for you, and um, they, uh, are, they protect you in a lot of ways, just like your offensive line protects your quarterback. And it's good to be nice to your nurse, just because same thing when the defensive line gets through and sacks the quarterback, it's not a good thing. So be nice to your nurse. So getting back to those websites that we were talking about, these were the ones that you've been seeing all weekend long, and these are still the ones that you should continue to look up if you haven't yet. Um, and when I say that these will educate you, I do mean the title here, Stay Connected To. Obviously, you all are the people that are interested in staying connected because you're here. And so I'm preaching to the choir, really. But um, to give you an example, to give you a couple of examples, uh, I had a Somebody emailed me about a patient that's not somebody within our clinic, but apparently he has transverse myelitis and his wife passed away recently, and he wanted to speak with somebody. This was just a few days ago. He wanted to speak with somebody. So a friend was emailing me on his behalf. He wanted to speak with somebody who was in a similar situation, and I don't know much about his disability. I don't know much about any, his life circumstances other than the fact that his wife has, has passed away. And so I said, your best resource is Sandy Siegel. So of course, he called Sandy Siegel on his home phone number, and he's already connected to somebody. This was a couple of days ago, and they, I've already gotten uh, a response that, thank you, we're all hooked up. We've gotten it done. So they really will keep you co connected. Sandy Siegel, as you've heard from his, his uh, story yesterday, will do great things for you. And um, along the same lines, we have a patient, Dr. Levy and I actually have a patient, Lisa who has NMO, and she is on a patient support website for NMO. I wish I could tell you what it is. She was supposed to have emailed it to us, and she has not. But uh, it's pretty amazing because she, you know, Dr. Levy was educating her. She's on Rituxan, and he was educating her that we have to follow your CD19 as soon as your B cell line starts to repopulate. We have to redose you, all this. And she's like, oh, I know. My, my friend in Florida told me. Well, her friend in Florida, it ends up, is is a somebody that she met through this website. And then we told her something else. Oh yeah, my friend in Pittsburgh told me. She really relates to these people as her friend. She talks to these people online every single day and she can't she doesn't talk about her next door neighbor in Virginia that, you know, she in the same way because they, they that person can't relate to what she's going through the way that her friend in Florida and her friend in Pittsburgh can. And so it's really amazing what staying connected to the pe people who have the same, si same kind of life circumstances as you can do for you. And so I encourage you to do that. So remember, it's your health, and uh, you call the shots. And I'm just going to leave you with this last point, that uh, a quarterback can throw the ball, but sometimes the quarterback has to run the ball himself or herself. And so remember that, that sometimes you've got to take the ball in your own hands and, and do with it what you will. So um, that's it. <laughs>